Brothers and sisters, after a solid month and a half of constant work on this demanding but immensely enjoyable project, I believe I can say with full confidence that I've brought it to the closest thing to completion that I'm capable of. There is always a balance to strike between what one would like to say and what one has time to say, especially in the real-time setting of a video that comments on the music as it plays, and I'm never sure that I've struck that balance successfully. Nevertheless, this is what I've got, and you're certainly welcome to it. It seemed wise to me to break this into two videos, as I did with my Cesar Franck D minor symphony project, offering you a measure of introduction in one video and furnishing the music and analysis in another. So you'll find that second part linked in the description below and are perfectly welcome to go directly to it if you'd rather skip my introduction. I will, however, try to make the latter worth your while. Mahler composed his eighth during the summers of 1906 and 07 and conducted its highly successful premiere three years later. It represents both a new direction in the composer's artistic journey and a kind of return. It is new in context. The fifth, sixth, and seventh symphonies had been purely orchestral works, as though Mahler had accomplished in his second through fourth the kind of utterance that becomes possible only when you add the, the human voice, either singly or in large collectives, to a musical form that had traditionally been a purely orchestral vehicle. It was, of course, Beethoven who first broke that stricture, and Mahler's second is certainly a response to Beethoven's ninth, as is the first in a different way, the third and fourth perhaps less so. But Beethoven does seem to be again in view here, with Mahler taking up Beethoven's line of development and raising it to the next level. That is, by writing a symphony not just with a choral finale, as Beethoven had, but a truly choral symphony from start to finish. And again, there are other considerations to mull over. For instance, Mahler's eighth is in the key of E-flat major, a key forever associated with the Eroica since the early 1800s. And Mahler had written another E-flat major symphony. Well, at least he finished one in that key. The symphony in question is the second, the Auferstehung, written over a considerable span of time from 1888 through 1894. The second is the first of Mahler's symphonies to exhibit a degree of progressive tonality over its entire course. It is a C minor symphony that ends in its relative key. And that is the key to which Mahler returned when he set his sights on a completely choral symphony. The eighth is well and truly in E-flat major, almost aggressively so, returning to that tonic center again and again after its inevitable and always colorful flights of harmonic fancy. That's one of the many reasons that it's impossible to talk about this symphony in terms that are usually appropriate to that musical genre. For his text, which in this case might almost be reckoned a libretto, Mahler chose the 9th century Pentecost hymn, Veni Creator Spiritus, thought at that time to have been written by Archbishop Rabanus Marus, but actually of anonymous authorship. Mahler wed this Latin text in a most unusual literary fashion to the final scene from Goethe's Faust, subjecting both to a degree of manglement in the process, but I'll have nothing to say about that since I'm not really competent to address it in the first place and have other aims in view anyway. Goethe's play is widely reckoned to be one of the most ambitious theatrical projects of all time, meant to draw together countless threads of literature, tradition, and philosophy. I wouldn't be the one to go to for an account of that. Nevertheless, the text painting in Mahler's music is vivid as always, and it's almost impossible to miss. 
Mahler's score famously calls for an unusually large body of musicians, which accounts for an unfortunate nickname that the composer himself did not authorize. Although there have been a few celebrated performances for which a thousand musicians were assembled, the usual number is somewhere closer to half that. The orchestra on stage is huge, five flutes with the fifth doubling piccolo, four oboes, English horn, three clarinets in B-flat and A transpositions, an E-flat clarinet and a bass clarinet, four bassoons and contrabassoon, eight horns, four trumpets, four trombones, tuba, timpani, bass drum, tam-tam, triangle, glockenspiel, bells, celesta, piano, harmonium, organ, two or more harps, mandolin, and the customary strings in large numbers. And those numbers are augmented by four additional trumpets and three trombones stationed at a geographical remove and summoned for the big climaxes. Then there are the vocal forces two mixed choruses, boys chorus, girls chorus, and eight soloists, three sopranos, two altos, tenor, baritone, and bass. The symphony was dedicated by Mahler to his wife Alma. This fact is reflected, I think, in some of the music's details. Obviously, I need to say a few words about the structure of this symphony, since that's generally my focus in videos like this. Understand that this symphony is like no other, and I struggle to find words that will be useful to you when you hear the piece. In my analysis of the Seventh Symphony, I indicated that its opening movement represents Mahler's last use of sonata form as a guiding principle in his symphonic structures. I guess I have to walk that back a little, but not by much. There's just enough sonata-like shape to the opening movement of this piece, the movement that Mahler identified as part one, to justify talking about it in those terms, although they certainly can't mean what they traditionally mean. To cite a single example, the big inflection point, the great pivotal moment in part one, is not where tradition would lead us to expect it. It is, rather, a radiant moment about halfway through an enormous, sprawling development section, and it certainly doesn't deserve to be relegated to development. It is, in fact, with that moment and with that text Accende lumen sensibus in funde amorem cordibus, Mahler finds the sentiment that draws these two literary borrowings created a millennium apart into a coherent whole. So, with your understanding that my use of sonata form terms in the following description is a convenience only, I'll proceed. The exposition is enormous. It does include clearly differentiated first and second thematic ideas. The first launched by the three-note quartal motive E-flat, B-flat, A-flat, a motive that will do an astonishing amount of work over the course of this symphony. A transition soon delivers us to warmer keys for the second group, which includes one of the most beautiful melodies Mahler ever wrote sung first by one of the soprano soloists in D-flat major with the words in play superna gratia que tu creasti pectora, fill with celestial grace those hearts which you created. The working out of this material is lovely beyond words and a great surge of musical enthusiasm soon returns the music to E-flat major for a rondo-like return of the opening theme adjusted just enough to make one wonder. It is at that point that the invoking of sonata form starts to make little to no sense. If we had heard this in a work written a hundred years earlier, when the symphonic tradition was securely in Beethoven's hands, we'd expect it to be the inception of a development section, probably in a sonata rondo context. But that's not what this is at all for there's still quite a lot of exposition to go before it's time for a development. 
And it is in that span of music that lies between that Rondo-like return and the actual development that some of the symphony's most bewitching magic happens. A third group that begins in D minor with a plea for help in overcoming bodily infirmities. The passage includes a fantastic improvisatory style solo for the concertmaster who actually gets a lot of public exposure in this symphony. And the continuation is just gorgeous, a choral plea for lasting vigor to overcome our earthly ailments. And that continuation is in E flat major, and that is the key in which the exposition ends or rather, approaches an ending that never arrives. Instead, here we get the development, a stupendous musical structure that begins with an apparent nod to Beethoven's pastoral symphony. When you hear it, I believe the beginning of the thunderstorm movement will come immediately to mind. The music that follows that deceptive cadence is some of the most imaginative Mahler ever wrote. Fragments of march tunes fleeting across the stage, sometimes belted out in solo and then in tandem in an assortment of near and far related keys over deep bells that cast a solemn pall over its somehow subdued energy. This development is in two large parts. The first, introducing some gorgeous new themes and taking up both musical and literary topics first encountered during the exposition. This great working out finally comes to a head in E major and in a heart-stopping moment, all the singers on stage intone in unison the defining text, Accende Lumen Sensibus, with a breathtaking pause after the first syllable before plunging ahead into the most vigorous music of the entire symphony. It might be a good idea at this point to mention the fact that a single rhythmic figure, a dotted eighth sixteenth pairing followed by a quarter note, is so ubiquitous in this movement and throughout much of part two that commentator David Hurwitz identifies it as the Mahler rhythm. And it is that rhythmic figure that does as much as anything to draw this sprawling outpouring into a cohesive whole. That wonderful defining moment happens just after the beginning of the second large part of the development, and it is followed by the most warlike music of the entire symphony, for the words hostem repellas longius, may you drive the enemy far from us, as well as an absolutely colossal triple fugue that turns remarkably personal at the end. At least, that's what I think is happening here. That fugue is, unsurprisingly, set in E-flat major. But a great crisis happens during its sixth answer with the music flying off into an A major tantrum and going completely off the rails. The significance of this passage is possibly revealed in the words of the Latin text, which Mahler has seriously mangled at this point. Creatimus omni tempore spiritum. Let us always believe in the spirit. This may be the nub of the whole argument. Mahler was no more capable of sustaining such belief than I am. That's not the only place this music runs off the rails. There's a follow-up crisis not long after that, out of which, almost as if extruded by Herculean effort, the first theme returns over a tenacious dominant pedal, the moment of recapitulation certainly, but really in name only, for this is not the grand cadential arrival in the tonic key that the end of the exposition deprived us of and that we've been waiting for ever since. It is simply a continuation of an unrelenting juggernaut of musical unfolding. When it does manage finally to wind down, it is into an abbreviated second group, which nevertheless does include some beautiful new ideas. The coda is very long and very splendid, concerned exclusively with the setting of the obligatory Gloria Patri. 
The returns are so splendid here, and the awe-inspiring sounds of the concert hall organ going full tilt along with all those extra brasses, just wonderful. And for this coda, the human voices stay engaged to the very end. What could possibly follow such a movement? 23 and a half minutes of extremely demanding, totally exhausting music with such a final sounding conclusion. Well, Mahler furnished a second movement of well over twice that length. But as it makes little sense to speak of movements in the symphonic sense when confronted with such titanic musical structures, Mahler chose instead to call them Erster und Zweiter Teilen first and second parts. The second part does not take the shape of any other symphonic movement I'm aware of. It's a little like a song cycle, perhaps a bit more like a cantata. I've chosen the latter as a way of describing it, dividing the cantata portion of the movement into four large stages, which might be thought of as corresponding roughly, very roughly, to symphonic movements. Those are four stages of a journey of redemption, and they are set up by a mostly quiet, slow-moving E-flat minor prelude of extraordinary length, almost 15 minutes long, and mostly presented by the orchestra alone. When the vocal forces are added, it is only very gradually and subtly, as their voices bring semantic detail to a nocturnal woodland scene metaphorically meant. When the music finally emerges into E-flat major, it is for the first of many arias, this one by someone who's just a little too happy, and countered by someone who's just a little too tormented. It may be that this symphonic essay is in part an attempt to achieve a healthy balance between those extremes, something that might be called joy. That is what this great journey offers, and the subject is the redeemed spirit of Dr. John Faustus, a scholar who overreached and made bad bargains. In addition to the obvious recycling of motives, one of them associated with the idea of aspiration, for instance, there are significant moments of thematic return in Part Two, one in each of its first three stages. The first, in stage one, is a return of the Excende Lumine Sensibus theme that supplied part one with its most important point of inflection. Here, gerettet ist das Erdlegleit der Geisterwelt von Bersen, the noble arm of the spirit world is rescued from evil or something of that sort, is sung by a choir of angels. It is with that song that the account of rescue begins. There are lovely interludes and myriad motivic connections to explore. Stage two begins with another return, this time of the third group from part one, that pessimistic sounding D minor plea for the strengthening of the infirm, now as a lament for the earthly residue that binds the spirit that would be free. This music opens up into E flat major exactly as during part one, but is succeeded then by no development section. Instead, well, there's something magical that I'll let you discover for yourself. Of course, there's much more to say about stage two, but there's little likelihood that you'd be able to hold it in memory between now and the time you hear it, so I'll talk instead about stages three and four. Stage three is just magical throughout, for me, the beating heart of this symphony. It begins with a vaultingly beautiful E major hymn to the eternal feminine, personified by Goethe as Mater Gloriosa, and continues with arias for three soloists identified as the greatest of sinners, she who bathed the feet of Christ in Luke 7, then the Samaritan woman of John 4, and finally of Mary of Egypt, whose story is told in the Acts of the Saints. The three women also sing as a trio, choiring music of almost incredible vibrance and luminosity. And the capstone of this salvific stage is the aria of a penitent formerly known as Gretchen, 
whose forgiveness of her inconstant lover of long ago is the seal of his salvation. It is she who will conduct him to his place in the heavenlies, and it is she who opens the way to stage four, the symphony's finale. That finale begins with a skyward beckoning by Mater Gloriosa, who is hymned extravagantly by Dr. Marianus and choral forces. This great song of praise, including the most ardent plea yet for mercy to be found really in the entire symphony, represents the end of the journey. What remains is the commentary that will make sense of it all. That commentary is delivered by the Chorus Mysticus. It is they who open the way to the symphony's denouement, which is simply glorious beyond any words I can begin to marshal. Just imagining it is simultaneously thrilling and draining. What more can I say? I'm deeply grateful for the six-week musical dive that I've made, and even though I don't have words for what I've found here, I'm happy to tell you that I love Mahler's Eighth deeply and had no idea that I ever would. There's just no other joy like that in my experience. That's why I do this. And I hope you enjoy the artifact that I've left here of that journey of discovery. The performance is by Claudio Abado and the Berlin Philharmonic with a great many singers whom I will identify in the video description below. Happy listening.